This is the story of whiskey, and I started right here in the heart of Tokyo. Around these streets are bars crammed with people imbibing the amber liquid. It'll be a fascinating journey, so come with me as I tell the story of Scotland's gift to the world. I'm going on a pilgrimage to find out why such a simple drink has come to mean so much. Hi, my name's Jim, I'm from Scotland. From the makers to the marketeers, and the chemists to the cocktail makers, and from the highlands to Hobart in Tasmania. I'll be meeting the people and travelling to the places immersed in Scottish whisky's world story. This is the tale of an ancient craft that became a global colossus. It is the tale of Scotch. The grand that this stuff's made in Scotland. Aye, but that's gay too. Today, we treat Scotch whisky with reverence. Yet as recently as the late 1970s, it was viewed altogether differently. When people thought of Scotch, they thought of old-fashioned, untrendy, blended whiskies. It was something of a safe, boring choice. Here, what your granda drank at Hogmanay and abroad ignored in favour of domestic spirits. By the early 1980s, too much was being made for not enough drinkers, creating a whisky loch of untouched liquid. Many distilleries closed. Then the industry recovered on the back of an unlikely source, single malts. Marketing was once more at the forefront via a bottle label vision of Scotland sold to the world. Now malts are booming, desirable and collectible and provoke global interest in Scotland. On Edinburgh's Royal Mile stands a building symbolic of this intrigue. The Scotch whisky experience is funded by a cluster of drinks companies. Among its greatest attractions is a breathtaking hoard of bottles. This marble and glass shrine to whisky contains 3,348 bottles. It is a magnificent collection and was collected by one man, Clive Vidis, a Brazilian from Sao Paulo. It took him 35 years to collect. And then he came to a financial arrangement with Diageo, and Diageo brought the collection here to Scotland. And as Mr. Vinnis himself says, we have an expression in Brazil, the good son returns home, and in my view, the collection is back with its family now. And here is Mr. Vinnis. This is where it all began. He was well known as being a real lover of Scotch whisky and business associates would always pick up a bottle in duty free for him. But finally a business associate went to visit him from Scotland and said, this is the real stuff. This is the stuff you'll never have heard of. It's called single malt Scotch whisky. And this is the stuff to keep and enjoy with only your very best friends. What date was this? So this was in the 1970s right. um, and really only blended Scotch whisky was exported at the time. It was very, very hard to find anything else. So these six bottles here were given to Clive then. Um, and rather than sharing them with his very best friends, he was so overwhelmed and so passionate about them that he never opened them. Uh, and this began the Scotch whisky collection. Now, people come from all over the world to view this, don't they? That's right, about 80% of the visitors that come here are from overseas. So uh, it just reflects the huge pool that Scotch whisky has and the kudos that it has from an international point of view. So they come because they love whisky in the first place? Well, they don't just pop in on a rainy day and think, where are we going to go in there? Well, you know, they don't come because they already know and love Scotch whisky. Most of our visitors are from overseas, have heard of Scotch whisky, know what it is, but aren't already Scotch whisky drinkers. So a small proportion of them love it and are enthusiasts and know about this collection and have made a bit of a pilgrimage but the majority of them have come to Scotland and there is no way that they could visit Scotland without finding out more about Scotch whiskey because the two are so intrinsically linked. You've got a black Beaumont 
from 1964. What on earth is that worth? You focused in on one of those bottles that's completely unique, really rare, only sold at auction. But equally, we have the opposite end of the spectrum. We even have um, whiskey and cola in a can. So there's nothing too precious about this. It's a snapshot of every single bottle of whiskey that was different, that was individual, that was unique, and that was collected over that period. So if you had to put a figure on the Black Bomore, what would it be? Ooh, tens of thousands Seriously? now. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. One of those ones that goes very well at auction. The Scotch whisky experience is in itself a giant display cabinet for an industry and, in turn, a country. Yet the rise of Scotch as a tourist magnet is a recent phenomenon. In the 1980s, there was very few distillery visitor centres, and now there's round about 50 distilleries that you can visit as a tourist to Scotland. So that has been a huge change in the whisky landscape. It is reckoned that in 2015 alone, one and a half million people visited Scotland's distilleries, spending £50 million. It is not only large established distilleries that they visit. Places that have been making whisky for centuries now face a challenge from dynamic small-scale upstarts like Strathairn Distillery in Perthshire. Over the last few years, there's been a quiet revolution happening in the whisky industry in Scotland. And that is the fact that we currently have about 20 small craft distilleries, with another 10 waiting to be operational. And they make whisky in the old style when whisky was made in a small room or a little button bay in a croft or a barn somewhere in a Highland Glen. And it's a bit like the, the craft beer revolution that's really exploded over the United Kingdom in the last few years. And it's really going to make a radical difference to whisky and our choices. And I'm standing in front of what is probably the smallest craft distillery in Scotland. Welcome, David, the smallest wow. distillery in Scotland. This is a dinky little thing, Tony. It's a miniature whisky distillery. It's also a bit like a, an adult's Meccano kit. This is a prime example of a small craft distillery, isn't it? There's currently 16 producing. We were the first, and we had a meeting here because so many people were asking me questions. And I said, oh, well, let's get together. And we had 50 people turn up. And it's not just whiskey. There's whiskey, there's gin, there's vodka, there's a rum distillery in the heart of Speyside. <laughs> I love it. Just because a distillery is small doesn't necessarily make it well crafted. But some of the small distillers are producing uh, products of uh, astonishing interest, astonishing versatility. Not all will survive. There will be a shakeout of, of that sector. But uh, Craft is certainly adding a lot of interest, it's adding a lot of vivacity, and it's adding a lot of choice for the consumer. So, on balance, it can only be good. Craft is a tricky word. What is craft? Is it doing uh, 20,000 litres a year and not more than that? Is it using, using old equipment, uh, old methods? Um, it's a tricky definition, but if we're talking about what kind of impact they can have on the industry, I think the biggest impact doesn't come from volumes, obviously, because they're small. I think it comes from the way they try to innovate. And I love that, because some of the big companies are too busy, too concerned to produce large volumes to keep their uh, stockholders uh, satisfied. I think that the emergence of craft distilleries has built this new layer into the industry, which is great. Um, it's driving a lot of innovation. Um, sometimes that can be at odds with the tradition of Scotch, which is you know, rightly protected. And we've been making great whiskey here for, for hundreds of years. We'll carry on making great whiskey, but if we can all operate under one banner more, um, if companies can work together more from, from opposite ends of the spectrum, then I think that can only be of benefit to the rest of the industry. Tony, are you a threat to the big boys? Not at all. I mean, you're creating very, very special whiskies. Probably the best way to sum this distillery is, if you drive up the A9 and you overtake a single whisky tanker, that's our year's production in one tanker. What we do supply to the big industry is a comparable quality product, and quality is the link between both of us. So the big distilleries, produce millions of litres a year, but 
you couldn't lean against the stills like this and have a conversation. No, you couldn't. You, you couldn't. couldn't turn the steam up slightly while we're doing it. People can come here and spend a week making their own whiskey. They can come in on the Monday morning and put the grist into the grist hopper. And on the Friday, after two distillations, they can make their own whiskey. There is clear excitement about the craft movement and it bristles with possibility. Whether in the long term each new distillery is financially viable though, remains open to debate. You need to have very deep pockets or a very understanding bank manager if you want to open a distillery. You know, it's got to be three years old before you can even call it whiskey. And while people might want to buy your whiskey when it's three years old, because it's exciting and it's new, when that whiskey is seven years old, people are going, ah, I tried that. I'm going to wait until it's better. Now, it might be perfectly good at seven years old, but, you know, uh, you know, received wisdom is that it only really matures when it's 10 or 12 years old. But it's really, really tough. You know, the big multinationals are going to watch the ones that float to the top that are producing very high quality product they might then suddenly try and snap them up. There might be some that are very adamant and stick to their ways and you know, say they'll be fiercely independent until the day they die. But then if somebody's offering you a huge sum of money, it's very hard for some people to turn that down. So I think that maybe what happens is those that are producing very high quality product will get snapped up. Craft distilleries are just one threat among many to the traditional and dominant Scotch whiskey industry. Whiskey is now made in almost 30 countries. Old Scottish methods are making for a vibrant scene, biting at the heels of Scotch whisky. Everywhere whisky is enjoyed, it seems, it is now being made. Despite the refined nature of this exquisite drink, Scotch is in a fierce global competition for hearts and drams. There are pretenders to Scotland's throne across the world, even here. Cheeky bastards. Andrew Nelstrop comes from a Norfolk farming dynasty who have put their abundant barley to good use. Farming sets you up well for having a distillery. They're both long-term businesses. Everything you do on, a, on the land, if you like, is designed for generations in the future. And the same goes with whiskey. Do you know what the Greek definition of wisdom is? Go on. Wisdom is old men planting trees under whose shade they will never sit. And that's the same with whiskey. Beautiful, isn't it? You're making whiskey that you'll probably never taste. You don't have the hills, you don't have the glens, you don't have the peat, you don't have the wonderful soft rain that comes off the Atlantic and falls on Scotland. And yet here we are in the heart of England and you're making bloody whiskey. Now that's a damn cheek. But we do have. Where'd you get your. We have all the barley. Uh huh. We have the largest peat digs in the whole of the UK, which is the Norfolk Broads. Uh huh. We've got the water, we've got the cleanest, largest, fresh source of water underneath your feet. We don't really need anything else, do we? Apart from rain. We don't need rain. You can have some of us if you want. Yeah, we'll we'll looking we'll today. Got, we've, got plenty, <laughs> we've got plenty of it. Father had always wanted to make whiskey purely because of one conversation he had back in when he was a lad. And it was my grandfather, the story goes, said, it's such a shame we got all this barley. So it has to go to Scotland to be turned into something useful. And it just stuck. You know, my father, he farmed in Russia, Australia. He went all over the place doing different things. But every year he went, oh, I just, well, I need to build a distillery. I need to build a distillery. So it was his dream. Absolutely, lifelong dream. So when he turned 60 um, and he was going, oh, we need to build a distillery, I think the rest of the family just went, oh, do what you like. <laughs> <laughs> Upstarts like yourself. Yes. Do you think you're any serious threat to the Scotch whiskey industry? Are you nibbling away? I think it's going to be a while before we buy Diageo, but... <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> could be another there's generation, a, maybe. There's ambition for you. But it's... I think, in terms of quality, we can equal them. I don't think that's an issue, I think... And I don't think that's me going, in our whisky can. I think any nation's whisky can equal anybody else's, because each distillery is unique. So if the owners want to do it properly, they can make blooming good whiskey. Um, in terms of volume, we're never going to compete. Andrew, every distillery I, I go to, and certainly this is much more true now than it was maybe 10, 15 years ago, every distillery has a visitor centre, and it seems to be an important 
point of revenue for them. Yes, yeah, it is. And it's uh, not just spreading the word. It's, it's about bringing in hard-down cash. It is. It's incredibly useful in terms of spreading the word and getting a loyal following, you know, come and see, it, see the distillery and meet the people. It's a great story. Uh, for new distilleries opening up like ourselves, the gin boys and vodka boys have got it easy, you know, make the stuff yesterday, sell it today. <laughs> today yes. Well, there's no cash flow issues there. Whereas the whisk world of whiskey, make it today, sell it in three, five, ten years' time, there is a slight need for another source of income. Which brings you down to having a shop and selling everything, from bottles of your own whiskey to tea and coffee and cake. And, yeah, it's a good source of income and it's a nice day out for people. Scotland's biggest whisky rival, however, is much further east. Over the last few years, the world of whisky has been rocked by a number of Japanese whiskies, winning critical acclaim and awards worldwide. Whisky's story has taken us halfway around the world. I'm now in the far north of Japan. If you fly that way, you hit Russia. We're probably on the same latitude as Vladivostok. Now, it's been a lovely sunny day, but from November till March, this place is blanketed in snow and well below freezing. And in the distance, you can see the scarlet chimneys that cap the Yuichi distillery, the home of Nika whiskey. And it seems very remote from a Highland Glen, but this place, the story of this place, is firmly rooted in a true Scottish romance. In 1918, 24-year-old Masataka Taketsuru left Japan for Scotland. He was to study the chemistry and production of Scotch whisky with the aim of replicating it in Japan. Masataka served apprenticeships at a number of Scottish distilleries, learning every craft of the trade. He fell in love with whisky, but also with a Scottish girl, Rita Cowan from Kirkintilloch. Rita and Masataka toured Scotland picking up more secrets of the Scotch trade. When they arrived here in Japan in 1920, it was to set up home as man and wife. Together in 1934, they put their expertise into practice and founded this place, the Yoichi Distillery, choosing these surroundings for their echoes of the Scottish Highlands. They were married for 41 years, until Rita's death in 1961. Masataka was to become known as the father of Japanese whiskey. Author Dave Broom is here at Yoichi researching a book on Japanese whisky. Dave, how does Japanese whisky differ from Scotch? Well, it's made in exactly the same way. So if you go around the distillery, you will see essentially the same kit. But there's a whole number of different factors that make it Japanese. I mean, one of them is uh, to do with the production. They run very clear wort rather than cloudy wort. So they don't get any uh, cereal characters coming through. So it's not as dry as Scotch whisky. And there's more of a kind of... Uh, it's a delicate intensity, which seems kind of paradoxical, but uh, there's a, I describe it as a transparency of, of character. If you think of a, a Scotch single malt, it's like a bit of a, like a Scottish burn. You know, all the flavours are kind of moving around and it's kind of hard to, to work out exactly what's going on, but mm -hmm. it's complex. Whereas with Japanese whisky, it's like a clear pool and you can see all the flavours and everything is just laid out in a very, very stately and ordered way. Uh, so it's got this That's very delicacy. symptomatic of Japanese culture. I, well, well I, mean, I think that's the point. I think because from the word go, Japanese whisky was made to go with Japanese food. And if you think of the way the Japanese approach food, it's all about texture, it's also about delicacy. And if you're making a whisky to go with that food, you're almost automatically going to be in that world. And there's a, a real cultural resonance to Japanese whisky that ties in with the approach to uh, ceramics or, or, or to artwork or, or to paper making. You know, I think it's all part of this Japanese culture. It's, it's, uh, it's a very powerful and very, very deep whisky. Uh, and it's significantly different to Scotch. You know, if I gave you two glasses blind and gave you one of Scotch and one of Japanese, you would say, well, that's different. So 
they make the best Japanese whiskey in the world. My mother goes and is in a walking group and I was listening to this conversation with one of the walkers and she was about 80 years old and she doesn't drink whiskey, she drinks gin. And someone was telling her about the fact that Japanese whiskey had just won a prize for being the best whiskey in the world and she was absolutely outraged. How would they know how to make whiskey? How would they know what they were doing? She was like, that's just ridiculous. I mean, they don't have the water. How can they be making whiskey? And I just thought, but you don't even drink whiskey, Doreen. You drink gin, you don't like whiskey. But for her, it was like a personal insult that the Japanese were making what she thinks is her drink that she doesn't like. Japanese public broadcaster NHK recently broadcast a 60-part drama about Yoichi's founding sweethearts. It has led to the distillery becoming besieged by visitors. This is a living link between the two countries and this drink. Sakuna-san, uh, you are the chief blender here in Yorji. Mm -hmm. How important is the influence of Scotch whisky and how it's made to how you make whisky here? Ano, tosha no sawyo sha no taketsuru masutaka wa Scotland de whisky o manan whisky zukuri o manan de kaite kuna Scotland nan desu ne. で、マスターっていうんですかね。あの、だから、そこに、例えばスコットランドの方が日本の青春、例えば青春の勉強をして、もしその方が本当にスコットランドでうまい日本酒を作ってやろうって考えてくれる人がもしいたら、それとでもあのすごいことですし。The production of whiskey may be similar in Scotland and Japan, but here it is enjoyed rather differently. The market went into this, this serious decline and companies were trying everything. They were flavouring whiskies, they, they, they were lightening them up, they were doing this, they were doing that. And uh, the young generation just turned their, their back on it. And eventually they went, oh, hang on a minute, there's this old drink called whisky soda, or the highball as it's known over here. They began promoting the highball and all of a sudden everybody began drinking it. You can get it on tap. I'm a big, big fan of the highball. I've and and it's, it's going, I it's think going I will right take, back. I think I will take some convincing. Well, you see, it's going right back to the origins of the people drinking whiskey in the mass market. You know, the, the reason that Scotch blends took off in the end of the 19th century was because people were drinking them as whiskey and soda. You know, and the reason why Japanese whiskey took off in the 1960s because they were drinking it dilute as a misoware, which is just whiskey and water. So we're actually just going right back to the beginning again. Before leaving Sapporo, I'm joining Dave Broom on a pilgrimage to the shared grave of Masataka Taketsuru and Rita Cowan, and leaving a traditional liquid offering. Eight hundred miles south in Tokyo, there is another little corner of Scotland, a wee back street bar called the Helmsdale. Masaki. Yes. We are sitting here in the most beautiful bar I've ever been in in my life. I think it's now my favorite bar, and we're in the heart of Tokyo, a Scotch whiskey bar. How did this happen? Scotland whiskey. Scotland but how did you how did you meet Scottish people? How did you first drink whiskey?僕が初めてスコットランドに行ったのが二十歳の頃でその時に大好きになりましたスコットランドが。Now your bar is called the Helmsdale. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Why? I like whiskey this way. North Highland, Cryneryish, 
Graham Ramsey, Flora, inside very small town hence their name. Very beautiful name sound. What are the most popular whiskies? The top. This brand is very popular and the Talisker. Talisker? Yes. Sky. Japanese style with soda. The cocktail name highball. Talisker highball. Very popular. Do you think Scottish whiskey, Scotch whiskey, is under threat from Japanese whiskey, Indian whiskey, Tasmanian whiskey? We'll never beat you, but we have the same heart. We'll try our best, but, uh, you know, we'll, you know we'll, we'll keep trying. A very poetic answer. I love it. Leaving Japan behind, I'm heading south to another whiskey hotbed, Australia, and specifically Tasmania. With sprawling hills, thick clouds and crashing sea, this could easily be Scotland. Across the bay from me, is the charming city of Hobart, nestling at the foot of Mount Wellington. And on this captivating island, it cradles 14 distilleries with more on the way. In fact, it's the heartbeat of the Australian whisky industry, a growing power to behold. This is Lark Distillery, the cherished creation of Bill Lark, godfather of Australian whisky. Chris, in many ways we couldn't be further from Scotland. We're on the other side of the world in the beautiful island of Tasmania. And here, you have something like 14 distilleries in production, and you're developing at least another half dozen. Are you the cheeky young upstarts of the whiskey industry? I think you could call us a bit of a, a larrikin bunch. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love our whiskey, and we've discovered that uh, Tasmania is a great place to make it. So we're doing our utmost to produce a good drop for the world. Well, you've been very successful. A few of them have been winning world awards, haven't they? Yes, we've been very fortunate, uh, both in uh, England and also in the US. We've won a number of awards. Um, and that's really encouraged us to keep doing what we're doing and to focus on the quality. We're, we're trying to make really quality whiskey um, and our volumes are not great. So it's about quality, not quantity. When Bill Lark uh, wanted to start a whisky distillery, there had been no commercial whisky distillery in Australia for 153 years. Federal law had made it impossible for small distilleries to operate. So before he could even start, he had to change government federal law to get his license. And so we are actually the first uh, licensed commercial distillery in Australia. Lark operates on a far smaller scale than most distilleries in Scotland. It's so ditchy in size. I mean, if you compare this to something like the Macallan. I love the size, it's whiskey in miniature. And they're taking over the world, the bastards. Craig, a Scotsman, and Chris, a native, are distillers here. I'll be honest, I got here 18 months ago and, and I walked into the place and I thought, where's the rest of the distillery? It's, it's tiny, the scale is, is crazy. I mean, we talk about handcrafted back in Scotland and you're talking 250, 300,000 litres. Here we make 120 litres a day, so we can actually handcraft everything at the distillery. We ferment different to, to back in Scotland, and we make all of our cuts here by how the, the spirit tastes. We've got a, a longer fermentation than, than you'd have at most places back home. Um, we've got seven days, but really the big one for us is coming to the end of fermentation based on how it tastes. We'll actually open the lids and let the natural bacteria from the vineyard up the road into the, the ferments and that sours up the the Of course, the you have the bacteria in the air already. So... Because you're surrounded, this is, this is vineyard country, isn't it? Absolutely. So Frogmore, our, our pals up the road, make some of the best wine here, some of the best Pinots in, in Tasmania, and we get all the benefit from that culture and from those yeasts and bacteria. So the whiskey that you guys have created, when will it be ready for sale? 
we're looking at about a, a six, six to seven year maturation and quarter cask. So something Tassie has is we have this really unique climate where we have a huge temperature variation from two or three degrees uh, up to about 40 degrees. And what happens is that fluctuates every day and the pressure fluctuates every day. And that really drives the spirit in and out of the wood and, and drives that angel share. So we've got a really quite a high angel share here, seven degrees. Our strength usually goes up, so we might get a spirit So what out. percentage would you lose every year? About 7%. 7%, 7 every, year. every year. Guys, I've said that Tasmanian whiskey, and you're winning the awards, the whiskey awards around the world, you're the cheeky young upstarts. <laughs> How much debt do you owe to the Scotch whiskey industry? So much. So much. I don't think the industry here would be in any strength without the year on year on year on year help from the, from the Scottish industry. Um, we've been so lucky that the generosity we talked before about that sense of community. It's not a community uh, in Tasmania or Hobart or Australia or Scotland or Japan. It truly is this global, global community. And you really feel that. Like, you go to Scotland and you ask the question, you get a genuine, passionate answer. Yeah, we're indebted to the, indebted to the Scottish industry. This place wouldn't be what it is without Scotland. We are essentially living the Australian version of what Glenlivet was in 1850. And I think if you said to any distiller back in Scotland, you know, if you could go back to 1850 and work in Glenlivet and see how things started, would you take that choice? Every single one of them would. We are still mashing in by hand with a paddle here. We've essentially brought whisky forward into the 1800s at large. <laughs> um, so to, to be in this position, but also then be able to, to call on the, the history and, and the mistakes that have been made by the Japanese and the Scots and the, the, the Americans and their whisky making process puts us in a, a unique position. You know, we've got hundreds of years of experience to call upon and then we can then create our own story from that. There are stories that people expect to see when they buy into a whisky. Um, and so in Scotland we're, we can sometimes be a little bit trapped by that and that's how people get to love this stuff. On the other you've got you know, countries in the rest of the world that are now making whiskies and can almost sometimes be a bit more creative in, in how they come about that and, and the sort of offering they can present. The competition element, I think, is brilliant because any good athlete or performer is going to say, your best performances come when you're under the most pressure. So, you know, we're kept on our toes by uh, the growth around the world, but I think that's a, a pretty good thing. We've talked for a long time about what is whiskey. It's an experience. It only becomes whiskey once someone puts it in their glass they, and they, they drink it, they experience with their mates. It's on the most important days of your life that you drink whiskey. Some people, it really is on the most important days, and they choose to share that with you as, as distillers, as people that get to be the caretaker of, of a, a distillery or a process. And that's what it's about. It's about understanding that if you're not spot on your game every day, then you're not doing justice to that person that got that bottle for their wedding, for their bucks, or maybe for their divorce, or to commiserate over a, a loved one's death. That's what drives, that's what drives that get better, get better, get better. And that's what, what whiskey's about, you're right, it's about people. It's always, about, always been about people. It's about community and people. And um, you can't help but love, love the spirit because the people are wonderful. Wow, Chris, that's the most beautiful poetic description I've ever heard. Sullivan's Cove is another of Tasmania's flourishing distilleries. Its architecture and design is somewhat more functional than that of a Scottish distillery. The idea of making whisky came along. At first I thought it was a bit of a crazy idea to make whisky here in Where Tasmania. Where did it come from? Well, Bill Lark. Bill and Lynn Lark, actually. But I, I can remember him trying to sell the idea to us up at the pub one night. Um, and how him and his father and Laura had been up in the, in the, in the lakes here fishing. And they, they're drinking a bottle of whiskey, wondering why we don't make whiskey in Tasmania. We've, we've got the climate, we've got the water, we've got the barley, everything's here. We've got the peat. We've got the peat. We've got, it. we've got everything we need. Why don't we do it? And so, um, so he came and, uh, one night up at the pub and told us of this idea. And what a marvellous idea it was. And we, I can remember thinking, no, nah, Bill, you, this, this, this is not a good idea. This, this is not one of your better ideas. <laughs> but I was wrong. It's one of these things where, to be honest, we didn't know we'd ever survive or even get our product out of Tasmania. 
I mean, it, was, it was a struggle for a long time to get anybody here to even try it. In the early days, uh, you know, people thought, oh, look, isn't that a nice idea? They're, they're, they're having a go, they're trying to make a bit of whiskey. But you've got to earn your stripes. It's, it's not a matter of just making a product and everybody will buy it just because you make it. it act, you have to prove that it's worth buying in the first place, or in our case, worth drinking. And it took us a while to get it right. And, and in some of the earlier whiskies that were made, I have to say, weren't the best. Uh, but once we got once we got the theory right and we got the practice right and we started making good whisky, um, we, we found that we could sell it, and, uh, but mostly overseas. So it was, it was France that first took us on. Once we'd won uh, the world's best single malt whisky out of, out of the UK, the World Whiskies Awards, everything changed. From that morning on, uh, it hasn't stopped. I mean, I, I can remember standing in our, in our bond store a few years ago, we had a bit over a thousand barrels, thinking, what have we done? We've made too much whisky, we'll never sell this. Uh, what are we going to do? And now I, I look at our whisky and think, God, I wish we had 10 times more. The extent of the Tasmanian whisky revolution is startling. It is a surprise. Yet when you're here, it makes perfect sense. In some ways, this place is a mirror image of Scotland. Closer to home and yet aesthetically different to Scotland, there is another surprisingly vibrant whisky country, Sweden. Ingvar Rond from Malmo compiles the malt whisky yearbook, seen by many as the Bible of Scotch. Ingvar is leading the way to the small island of Hven, visiting its distillery and spirit laboratory. I think the interest in, in whiskey started probably in the, I would say, 60s and 70s, when we started to watch all these uh, fantastic uh, TV series from, from from England, where in every two minutes they were drinking whiskey. Coming, coming home after work, they were sipping a whiskey. And we've always, in Scandinavia, and Sweden in particular, been influenced by British culture. So that's when I think we started to embrace whiskey. And then it took off fantastically in the, in the 90s, where it wasn't just about drinking whiskey, it was about going to the distillery to see how it's produced about learning about whiskey. I, I know that some uh, Scotch whiskey brand ambassadors who come to sh whiskey shows in Sweden, they're absolutely amazed about the knowledge that Swedish whiskey drinkers have. Venn Distillery was founded in 2007 and is one of eight in Sweden. As well as making whiskey, it houses a state-of-the-art laboratory providing services for drinks companies across the world. What we do here is our Swedish whiskey, it's our whiskey, not definitely just Swedish or, or uh, Scottish, uh, still most of the Scottish people are just Vikings not traveling back. So, so you have the heritage from us anyway. Uh, but uh, end of the day, there's so many different whiskies uh, and the one doesn't kill off the others. There's a whiskey for all. What we do in here is we're very particular about our oak maturation, but also how we create the cut. Uh, Obviously, being small, we need to have our unique selling points, <clears throat> and we need to make something that really tastes, really scents, because volume couldn't be our, our, our sale thing. So uh, we go into special varieties of fermentation, special yeast strains, special varieties of wood, for example, uh, but also uh, with the laboratory, where we have a unique possibility of actually seeing what's happening during maturation, we do analysis for a wide variety of, of distillers around the world. A lot of people say that now the Scotch whiskey industry is in big trouble because they are being chased by so many producers around the world. Yes, there is more competition now, but at the same time, we have at least 100 distilleries in Scotland. We have four or 500 years of tradition in Scotland. You can't just wipe that away just because there are new distilleries that started 10, 15, 20 years ago producing in Tasmania or Sweden. They make beautiful whiskey, but for the next 20 or 30 years, 
I don't see them as a huge competitor to, to Scotch whiskey. Back on the mainland in Malmo is the Bishop's Arms, a cosy British-themed pub specialising in single malts and run by Croatian whisky fanatic Maya Kozuo. I'm very curious about everything, uh, to be honest, and I think whisky is very good, good to have, enjoy. It's very much about people. That is a different driving Ferrari, or that is a different riding bicycle. And that is, the, if you compare whisky, with something else. Every Bishop's Arms staff member is trained to become a whiskey specialist and advocate. Service is very important. There is still people who come in our bar and they look at the shelves and say, what is all that? And you start there. And you start there and can I have a double whiskey? And we start often saying, well, would you mind to have a three smaller one, same amount, same money, and just discover something new? So you kind of have to educate your guests as you're educating your staff at the same time. The Bishop's Arms has won two prestigious awards. Maya is spending the prize money on a celebratory staff trip. We're going to spend that money with a trip to Scotland, of course. I'm going to be visiting uh, Glenkinchy Distillery, and uh, we're just going to have an inspiration tri trip with my staff so we can uh, keep it live. Glenkinchy is a lowland distillery outside of Edinburgh, founded in 1837. By the old port of Leith, it's time for a trip to Tuchter's Landing, a pub whose assets include a high-stakes game of hoopla. Checking if they have any whiskey, we don't. <laughs> so we try that one. It's very good to see how other people work with the whiskey, not just us. It's a living product. It's not, not just something you, you pour into a bottle and pour colorant in. It's a living product that goes into casks and it's made of barley. It's kind of it, it makes it a lot more real to see a distillery and see why and why you should appreciate whiskey. Our guide Clive was very good. Uh, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was really good. He showed us a picture um, up from about 100 years ago with about 50 people who used to work there. And uh, it was really interesting just seeing that that must have been the whole village worked at the distillery. And now he told us that it's two people work 12 hours and then two people do the late shift and the whole thing runs off that. How, how the, the whiskey making has changed over a hundred years, but they can still get the same product. Ready? Oh! Oh! I get a bucket of ice. <laughs> <laughs> should we have a hoop? We should have a hoop. We should have a hoop. Have to hide away all the single cask guard bag, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how that's going to work out with the Swedish alcohol law, because selling alcohol in Sweden is not allowed to be fun. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it has to be quite straight and direct. <laughs> There's no such thing as happy hour in Sweden. Spending time with this impassioned, knowledgeable Bishop's Arms team, I wonder whether we in Scotland train our own bar staff enough, and even if we take scotch for granted. Very often you can walk into a bar in Scotland anywhere and say, oh, excuse me, can I 
uh, have an Isla whiskey, please? Oh, I don't know. You need to come behind the bar and have a look. Fifteen years ago, somebody came to our bar and said, uh, could you tell me a good whiskey? And then they came straight to me because the lassie didn't have a clue behind the bar. So we thought, right, we'll sort this out. So we'll get some of the distilleries in, we'll get some proper staff training, because there's no point having the stuff if you can't mm -hmm. sell it. Mm -hmm. So um, the guys all came in and we got up to the whiskey experience and uh, no, it's, it's good. We kept meeting people um, who worked in bars and sometimes they worked in the, the very best hotel bars in Edinburgh where we knew all the international visitors were coming. Um, some really high-end visitors were coming, staying in those beautiful five-star hotels that we have. And at that time, um, they weren't necessarily getting great information about Scotch whisky. And I have to say that's changed massively um, in the last 15 years, um, both in terms of the, the number of whiskies that are available, the number of specialist whisky bars that there are. Um, but there's still much, much more to do. And I would completely agree that um, across a very broad portfolio in Edinburgh, if you look at lots of places that you can taste whisky, you aren't necessarily going to find um, everybody serving you that really knows um, about Scotch whisky and is, is passionate about it. You talk to whisky drinkers around the world. How did you find out about Scotch whisky? They were introduced to it by a bartender, by a brand ambassador. They came on holiday to Scotland. They visited a distillery. Um, and it's so important. So even it goes back to to the starting of whiskey and uh, you know what happened there the introduction the personal contact remains absolutely key this is the great city of London a city that has quaffed whiskey for hundreds of years it's also a city that has begun to distill its own whisky yet again. And it's also the city that has stoked the debate about how exactly this drink should best be devoured. And that includes, and this is heretical, some mutiny against tradition for some, including myself, drinking whisky and cocktails. Now, I'm about to go into this hotel to talk to the 2015 World Barman of the Year. And if he mixes me a cocktail, he's going straight to the tower. Ryan, on a daily basis, you commit sacrilege in this bar <laughs> because you take some really, really decent whiskies that take years and years to mature into all the richness of flavours, and then you throw in all sorts of other liquids, and you throw in strawberry crushes and you botanicals, <laughs> and you make dreadful cocktails out of them. That's, I'm guilty of that. Why? To me, it's been the, the beauty of whisky. It, is, it does have big, bold flavours. It's got all of these interesting characteristics, and to me, a cocktail is just a new way of experiencing that. So it's, to me, it's not about kind of masking any of the flavours and just hiding it away as, as a bland alcohol. The beauty of using scotch in these things is it has all these characteristics. Whiskey should be drunk any way you want it to be. Um, I am a big fan of not being prescriptive about drinking whiskey, and I think we're seeing that more and more nowadays. Um, I love whiskey cocktails, whiskey highballs, whiskey neat, whiskey on the rocks. Um, in a nosing glass, you know, being more professional or literally out of a flask when I'm walking up a big hill and it's freezing cold. <laughs> I think the industry need to find a way of keeping their older consumer happy by doing, you know, what they love and what they're going to keep buying, but also not being scared to innovate and, you know, not being scared to talk about putting in mixes and talk about putting in ice and water and, you know, getting more people just to experiment with it and find out what they like rather than using the old method where it was kind of preached and you were told you must drink it neat you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. And I think that image has really turned a lot of people off. So however you want to drink your scotch, you drink your scotch however you like it. And don't let anybody tell you you can't. But there are limits. So I got my father for one Christmas a really expensive bottle of Highland Park. Now, Highland Park is a beautiful scotch. And I took it round and we were celebrating Christmas. And the first thing he did was he opened it and there was a bottle of dry ginger at one side and this really amazing bottle of Highland Park at the other and they both went in the same glass. So that's where you draw the limit. If you want to get somebody to experience a, a, a new spirit, something different, a new flavour, it can be a bit much just giving them a neat dram, especially when you've got something cast strength or smoky and all of a sudden they're put off by it. Everybody's got that story of, of kind of drinking whiskey, stealing it from their dad's cabinet and going, no, I don't like this stuff, and they stick with that idea, whereas 
whiskey runs this amazing gauntlet of flavor, and you've got light, delicate, lowland drams through to big, smoky, rich islas, and you want people to go, right, actually, there's a new way of experiencing this, and using a cocktail, if you do it delicately, is a way of introducing new flavors to them. Actually, this drink's been on our menu since the beginning. Um, and I've always tried to involve whiskey cocktails. I, it's my favorite spirit, it's what I've loved. I lived in Scotland for a long time, it's very close to my heart. So this is essentially a, a, a twist on a whiskey sour, but it is a bit of an unusual one. Um, so I'm gonna warn you of that before I get started. If people want to enjoy their whiskey with a lot of nosing and sniffing and looking at the color, well, good for them. It's their whiskey, they've bought it. If they want to slam the glass full of ice and, and stick a branded cola on top of it, well, I might wince. It might not be for me, but it's their whiskey. It's a free world. On they should go, as long as they enjoy it. This idea that you, thou shalt not touch, really only is about 30 years old. And I think it's done irreparable damage to, to the Scotch whiskey industry because people, it's a strong drink. And people take a sip of it because you're not allowed to add water to it. It's, gee, you know, come on. It's about pleasure, guys. It's not about pain. So, you know, I would add anything you want to Scotch whisky. Just enjoy it because it might be a great complex drink, but it's just a drink. Ryan, the more I explore whisky, the more I realise it is a form of alchemy. Mm -hmm. And um, you're taking it a stage further, aren't you? Well, to me, the you know your whisky blenders, be that blended whisky, be that um, single malts, they're essentially making cocktails. They're bringing all these different elements together, creating a harmony that tastes greater than the sum of its parts. Hopefully this is gonna be a new side of this whiskey that you won't have tried, so. This will be a first time for me. Okay, I'm hoping this works. That's surprisingly refreshing, dare I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably lose half my friends. <laughs> So what does the future hold in store for Scotch? Not only is there an explosion of small-scale craft distilleries, some of the older established producers are investing big money too. This is Straths Bay in the northeast of Scotland. It's an area that contains the greatest density of whisky distilleries anywhere in the world. It is also home to the Macallan, one of the best loved and most revered whiskies in the world. Macallan have been here for over 200 years. But currently, the demand for Macallan is outstripping supply. So the company are investing the small sum of 100 million pounds in creating a cathedral of whiskey due to open in 2017. This beautiful new distillery on the island of Harris is proof too that there is confidence in the future of Scotch. It's a very exciting time, I think, for distilling, especially here in Scotland. We've got a lot of new distilleries appearing. There's a lot of gin distilleries which are going to be leading into making whisky. But the same thing's happening all across mainland Europe, all throughout Asia, and there's a lot of new distilleries appearing. But I think it's very important that Scotland doesn't lose focus so that they keep creating very high quality spirit. But I think we're lucky in, in a way because we have the heritage that all of these mainland European distilleries and Asian distilleries will never have the same heritage as Scotland has. The big challenge in whisky is trying to balance innovation and tradition. Uh, I think it's very possible to do that and, and to produce something amazing. I don't know if it's going to turn out just as fine as, as everyone in the industry thinks and, and hopes and believes. And there are going to be some casualties on the way. Maybe some of those small craft distilleries are, are going to fall by the wayside uh, in that kind of creative destruction of the marketplace. But overall, I think we probably will take the right turn. I think we will go on uh, to the sunlit uplands, and I think uh, there is a bonny future for Scotch. We've made Scotch whisky for hundreds of years. It has proved the test of time. It is revered as the pinnacle of the distiller's art worldwide. Um, because of its character, its quality, its soul. 
and it will continue to um, to do well. So I see it actually as a, as a moment of opportunity for Scotch whisky, uh, because the more that Scotch whisky industry is looking over its shoulder, sort of going, oh, uh, well, bourbon's becoming popular, maybe we should be like bourbon, uh, or Japanese is becoming popular, can we be like Japanese? Then you've lost it. You've lost the battle completely. But not everyone is as confident about the future. I actually think that if you look at whiskey, the historic whiskey graph, it goes up and down. I remember in the 80s with the Whiskey Lake and shut half of Scotland's distilleries, it's coming. When they, what has Scotland done? Doubled production in the last four years? The moment that whiskey is live and ready for sale, we haven't suddenly got twice as many whiskey drinkers in the world. Therefore, this is just going to, there has to be a mountain of whiskey building. And at some point, it'll all go down and we'll all have a bit of a downturn. And then we'll, yeah. So, what is, so what's your opinion on, say, the uh, Macallan spending 100 million on this new facility? Really, really cool. But didn't they, you know, they've doubled production. Do they think they can sell twice as much whiskey? If they can, brilliant. But right? that means somebody else isn't selling any. Mm -hmm. We haven't suddenly got everyone buying twice as many bottles. So. The industry has to do a bit of a dip. And um, those that have got their houses in order will be fine, and those that have borrowed to the hilt and expecting it to continue willy-nilly probably will wake up with a headache, but we'll see. That's the joy of whiskey. I mean, you design a business to work over generations, not, in, not over a decade cycle. As I have seen Scotch whisky sprung from Caledonian terrain and bewitched the world. Its ascendancy has been driven by pioneers, from early innovators and the entrepreneurs who first exported our wares, to today's scientists, blenders and craft distillers. Yet what strikes me most is despite all that, the drink itself remains a charming enigma. The causes of its sumptuous taste, impossible to agree upon and even opaque and mysterious. There will be peaks and troughs and pretenders to the throne, but because of that sorcery, Scotland's tipple of genius will always prevail. The future's bright, the future's amber. Again, very near last orders, folks. In the end of my journey, a wonderful journey through the magical world of whiskey. I hope you've enjoyed it. From Highland Croft to Hobart Visionary, there's a, an amber thread that embroiders the globe. When a cunning alchemist distills a spirit, the liquid drops fall into a cask, and there something truly, truly colossal happens. Scotch whiskey affects history and defines identity. It embraces science and big business and the land, and yet, and yet at its heart, this mixture of water, barley and yeast is just a simple, beautiful taste of heaven in a glass. Slodger. Neil Oliver explores the possible links between racism in America's Deep South and the Scottish settlers that first occupied it in Scotland and the Clan, available now in the Scotland category on BBC iPlayer.